today. I'm going to uh, this close to the microphone, everyone can hear me okay? Yeah. Great, great. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about um, how we can, in maybe a more informed, rational way, hopefully more successful way actually, get uh, college drugs to the clinic. And I think a lot of the points I was, I was making some notes that Vince was talking about when he and when we kick things off in terms of cost-benefit analysis, is a big area that um, what I'm going to talk about really plays in. It's not just about getting um, improving therapeutic outcomes. That's a big piece of it. But a big problem we had in oncology, as we have in, uh, in, in a lot of disease areas, but really in oncology, is very high failure rate. That failure rate results in, of course, many drugs not making into patients. But it also results in a lot of costs needing to be absorbed by those drugs that do make it to the clinic, right? Uh, to the markets, I should say. And as a result, who pays for that ultimately? Right? Payers pay for it. People pay for it. Folks that, that Vince was talking about. So a, a way to accelerate to the clinic, to reduce the, to reduce the, um, the number of failures you have on the way to the clinic certainly gets better drugs to patients, but it does it in a more cost-effective way, in a more timely way, and all those things ultimately result in uh, positive outcomes for um, companies that are trying to ultimately you know, do a deal, do that deal that Vince was talking about. So this is a little bit on, on a slide that really points out in that, in that red square there, where we have very low probabilities of success in oncology drug development. Right. Uh, lower, really, than all other indications. We've done a better job in the past couple of years in, improving, in buffing up some of these probabilities of success, but oncology still suffers greatly from this. And one of the reasons that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about, and there are, you, know, you ask 10 people, 10 scientists, and there'll be 12 reasons, uh, but one of the reasons that I'll talk to you about today is really the preclinical modeling, the translational modeling that we have to do in cancer. Cancer. Is, in itself is kind of a misnomer, right? I mean, think of it as, well, we don't think of it, but it is one name, it is one word, and it is probably a thousand diseases. So the idea of trying to develop a drug for a thousand diseases is, you know, most people would think an insane idea. So we need to start breaking down cancer into much more uh, narrow bands, um, not necessarily just lung cancer, but what, not necessarily just adenocarcinoma lung cancer, but biomarker definition, right? Um, and you have to look no further than the, the recent success of Merck's Keytruda, uh in PD-1, which wasn't targeting the cancer cell it, itself, but was using a biomarker cutoff in order to, to have the success that they've had. So what are the tools we use um, to help improve those probabilities of success, to help increase the, uh, the number of uh, drugs that ultimately make it to the market, but improve that cost-benefit um, outcome. And so at BioZero, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, capability here, but really the, what I want to focus on today is the use of patients themselves. Patients themselves in a translational or preclinical setting. So how do you do that, right? Um, well, it starts with testing and utilizing patient tissues, tumors, from a diverse set of patients, um, tens of thousands of different patients potentially, and to evaluate your drugs in that context. To understand, we know that cancer is a heterogeneous disease. Can we model that heterogeneity? Can we capture that heterogeneity? And can we actually insert that diversity into our preclinical testing strategies? Right? And we can. And we do it in a we do it in a couple ways, and I'm not going to take, go through this sort of uh, sort of fully boring table, let's say. But essentially, we have in vitro models, and we have in vivo models that are both in, model the tumor directly or bring in immune cells to create immune immune competent setting where we can look at immune oncology agents. And at a, a real heart of trying to look at patient diversity in a preclinical setting is actually this bucket here, a cancer biobank, right? There are many there are many cancer biobanks out there. Most of them, though, are FFPE or some kind of dead tissue. And the bank that we have at Bioduro, which actually came through the acquisition of a company that I started with the current president of Bioduro um, years ago, a molecular response, 
is right is is right here. So we have 100,000 plus specimen biobank of tumor specimens. But what's unique about these is that they're viable. And these viable specimens can then be used for a lot of different kinds of studies. The kinds of studies you think about a lot, cytotoxicity studies or um, epigenetic, epidemiological studies, uh, perhaps. But the functional role really takes on. You can look at in vitro proliferation, you can look at in vivo xenograft studies, and so on. Um, so I want to talk a, a bit about how we can do that using this extremely large biobank. The bank came, as I just mentioned, to BioZero through the acquisition of molecular response. And the access or the availability of these human tumors that are viable really allows us to do kind of in vitro and in vivo studies that otherwise we would, we, we've never been able to think about at this scale. A little bit of background on this, on this bank before I show you some of the, some of the work that we've done. Um, it's tens of thousands of patients. Right? This is a massive, massive scale. It covers more than 70, a little more than 75 actual clinical diagnoses. And you see a little spectrum of, of uh, the pie chart here really describes what kinds of cancers are represented. And the short answer is most cancers are represented. Um, common cancers are represented frequently, breast, lung, colon, uh, melanoma. Uh, rare cancers are represented uh, as well in pretty significant numbers. So you could look at things like uh, small cell lung cancer, for example. Right? That is not a very common uh, disease. It represents maybe around 5% of total lung cancer. And we have those numbers in, in pretty significant numbers. Because although these little slivers here look quite small, this pie is quite big. So even the little slivers are hundreds of patients. And so what do we do with some of these things, right? I mentioned to be able to model better, to be able to make better bets as we take our drugs into the clinic. And those better bets aren't just around better molecules, but they're also around better patients, right? Who are the patients we should be administering these drugs to? And it starts by being able to actually run those kinds of studies, uh, if you will, clinical trials, in a preclinical setting. And a clinical trial is, of course, a population-based uh, study. You're looking at, depending on what phase you are, maybe you know, tens to hundreds uh, of, of, of patients. And so that, that that diversity is really observed and captured by looking at many, many patients in a preclinical setting. So um, this cartoon really highlights within each tumor specimen that we have in this bank that we're about to use and test in some, in some kind of pharmacology, a pharmacologic way, what's in there, right? They're not just tumor cells. Tumor cells are heterogeneous and challenging enough. But beyond the tumor cells, there are immune cells and there are stromal cells and each of these cell types represent their own class of targets, right? Uh, so, to give you a, the, the, an idea of the data that goes, that, uh, the real data beyond that picture, you can really observe it here. When we take a tumor out of our, out of our cryobank, out of our biobank, and prepare it for use in some kind of preclinical or translational uh, uh, study, maybe an in vitro pharmacology assay, or ultimately perhaps a patient drive xenograft model, or both. Uh, this is how it starts. You thaw the vial, and what you end up with is a mixture of different cell types, a very heterogeneous mixture, uh, which contains everything that was in that vial, everything within that tumor biopsy. And we ultimately separate those out, can separate those out, as you see on the far right of this panel, into selective growth conditions. So from the same specimen, from the same patient, you can grow out tumor lines, you can grow out uh, lymphocyte expansion, and you can grow out fibroblasts, probably the easiest thing to grow out. And so now you have actually three different classes of cell types that are established as lines. You can bring these things back together, you can utilize them separately. And what you have are these autologous from the same patient kinds of really capturing what's going on within that, within that patient tumor. All right, we've got the basics. So you've got the material, if you will, the raw material we just went through. Now how do you use it? Um, it's great that we have actually these direct tumor specimens. And as a genomics guy, this was, was, was mentioning I spent a lot of time at, at Affymetrix, I've studied the genomics of cell lines for a long time. And what I, can, what I and others can absolutely tell you is that the cell lines that we know and love, HeLa cells, MCF7, whatever it may be, A549s, 
these guys that have been on plastic growing for the past 50 years or so, in many cases, their genomics don't look anything like the patients from which they came. You might have amplifications uh, that are clinically relevant copy numbers of three or four, and in these cell lines, they're three or four hundred, right? So cell lines um, in themselves don't really represent the patient that we're trying to treat. When we take those cell lines and put them into our normal growth culture conditions, which is on plastic, atmospheric levels of oxygen, neutral to even sometimes basic pHs, high glucose levels, these don't represent the patients we're trying to treat either. Because those conditions are completely anomalous to what's happening in the patient. So now you've got, in a, in a perfect storm, tumor cells that no longer resemble the patient and growth conditions that no longer resemble the patient. And the outcomes that we might hope for no longer resemble the patient. We think we've got a better way to do it. And that's really through the use of, uh, at least on the in vitro side of things, using 3D culture, but there's a lot of different kinds of 3D culture, aligning that to the human tumor microenvironment. So I'll give you one slide on, on the sort of high level overview of this, where what we've looked at over really the past 10 years of developing this kind of assay out and optimizing it and making sure that our growth conditions look as similar to the human tumor microenvironment, as similar to the original home of that tumor as possible. We will adjust things like pH, for example, in tumors. Uh, you have an effect which is well documented, it's been known for many, many years, as the Warburg effect, where the pH of that tumor is actually acidic, right? So why would we grow our tumors in our cell culture systems at a neutral or non-acidic pH? It's a simple thing, but it's something that most people don't do. We do it. Um, and similarly, you can look at a lot of these parameters here, whether it's glucose levels or oxygen tensions or the matrix itself. So all these factors combine to create a uh, what we call HTME 3DX, human tumor microenvironment 3D uh, growth. And these drug responses we see in that environment really are most similar to the kinds of drug responses we see in the clinic. One other point that I'll, I'll mention actually is um, actually this, this uh, feature here, stromal cells. So the presence of paracrine factors, the presence of um, human ligands, human growth stimulators, human factors that signal these tumors to grow in normal growth culture uh, systems. I think we've all probably done it. We're using field bovine serums. So you have all these cow factors lying, you know, present stimulating the growth of these tumor specimens or these cell lines. And ultimately what ends up, uh, what can end up happening is your cell lines grow, but if they require human factors, and there's classical examples of this where um, for example, IL-6 receptor or uh, CMET, right, require human ligands to drive through that biology. There is a species disconnect. And if those human ligands are not present, the cells can grow, but they'll grow through a different biology, right? And so now we've, we've, we've basically forced a different biology in our traditional cell culture systems. We're restoring that human biology in this system here. So. This is just convincing you that there's a lot of publications that we and others before us have, have put together on this. Happy to share um, any, uh, any of these with you. Um, and I wanted to put together this one, this one slide which gives, uh, 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 gives an idea of the kind of clinical validity that we, that we can see utilizing this human tumor microenvironment 3D culture system. So this is a small study. There's been a number of these that we've done, but this is one of these small studies where we actually looked at in and a, a handful, it's a low end, but still six platinum, uh, six ovarian uh, cancer patients. And what you see here is three of those patients highlighted in that top row um, where you can look at patient response. There's a responder, and a partial responder, and a non-responder. Um, when we, when, uh, and they're responding to platinum, so this is the platinum response. When we do the 3D culture uh, within this, with our human tumor microenvironment system, Essentially what you see is uh, platinum is the blue curve and then platinum taxol is the green curve. But when we especially look at platinum, which is the comparator for the clinical treatment there, what you see is a real mirroring of that clinical response. And when you put the same tumors into a mouse and you grow them as patient-derived xenograft models and then treat with, with platinum, you see the same response here. 
So we have really a preservation of response from clinics to 3D to, um, to uh, 3D in vitro to uh, in vivo xenograft. And this gives us a lot of confidence. We've done this now with, you know, this is one study. Um, there's been a number of published studies making similar kinds of comparisons, at the, um, as well as we've done a lot of work on a population basis, looking at 20 to 50 patients at a time and observing that the response we see in this 3D culture environment actually mirrors the response we see in a population study in clinical trials. So a lot of validity behind this. The benefit to this, okay, yes, it's more valid and, and the, the results will translate and recapitulate in the clinic, um, but, and ultimately that has a lot of, a lot of uh, benefits to the patient, of course, hopefully. But one is time savings, and right, this is actually something that Vince talked about too, which is patent life. And so if you're trying to do these studies um, without the biobank, right, uh, without a collection of tumors to plug into that, um, collect, prospectively collecting tissue is one of the most lengthy things that you, you will have to wait for in any of these kinds of you know, translational in vitro systems. And so this is an example of a study we did. This is actually 26 small cell lung cancer patients that were evaluating the drug. Uh, in an in vitro pharmacology assay, which is using the system we've talked about, right? And what you can see here is very quickly being able to run the run the in vitro assays, distinguish responders, non-responders, and kind of intermediate responders, and this takes a couple of weeks. To get 26 small cell lung cancer patients in prospective uh, collections, depending on kind of the firepower you bring to it, it might take six months to five years, okay? And here we are compressing it into two weeks, right? So this kind of study is, is not always, you know, saving six months here is not necessarily gonna give you six months of patent life, we're not saying that, but it definitely helps point you in that right direction. Um, so we've taken our bank, our 3D culture system, relevant tumors, relevant uh, biology, relevant culture, condition, environmental conditions, and have actually established a collection of lines, uh, which we, which uh, are essentially primary lines uh, across many different cancer types. You can see that pinwheel of different, uh, different cancers. And these now are established lines that meet all the checkboxes of uh, you know, translational relevance. And we use these routinely within our with, uh, to screen clients, to screen client compounds and partner compounds. Um, so one of the things that's really important, right, and this is now I'm just kind of getting to some of the, the biomarker side of things, being able to define who that patient is, right? Who is the patient that is most likely to benefit? Right? That translates to if you're able to do that, why do if you're able to run one, it goes back to it, benefit the patient to a higher degree, but two, run smaller trials, cost less, right? Ultimately, that cost-benefit analysis tilts, right? If you increase the benefit, reduce the cost, that's what you want to do. So when, when our partners are thinking about what's, what patients they should be evaluating in the clinic, they need, they need to think about those criteria preclinically, right? And the way we do that is by helping them to understand a lot about the models we have. This is a database, an online data portal that we've recently, um, uh, we've recently rolled out, kind of in beta right now actually, which should be launching fully, fully uh, commercially in the coming month, month or two. And uh, essentially, for all the models we have, what you're able to do is go in here, look at standard care pharmacology. You can't read this, but this is actually a uh, this is actually a liver. This is a liver model here, where in this case, where you're looking at uh, sunitinib, cisplatin, and a serafinib treatment response. So, for instance, if you're trying to go into um, you know. Okay, or in gem in here, but if you're trying to go into gem resistance or sunitinib failed uh, treatment, pick a model from a patient that features those phenotypes, right? And you're able to do that. If you're trying to, if you have a hypothesis around uh, a biomarker, whether it's a gene expression or mutation one, you can't really see it here, but this is queried by EGFR in both cases, you're able to just query the models and select which models make most sense to your biomarker hypothesis. And in this way, you can create some really informed, some really targeted studies uh, using a, a, a very large model collection. So on the in vivo side, um, we've done all this kind of population testing in vitro. On 
the in vivo side, there was a, a growing uh, patient drive xenografts collection. I'm not going to bore you with all the details. There's about 100, a little over 150. Uh, 25 of which on the right side are actually matched to that primary line collection. It's something we call um, screen and verify. Screen in that HTME 3D platform, verify in vivo. And I want to take you through this one case study on the PDX side of things. And this is how we can really utilize patient diversity in a preclinical setting to build confidence in our clinical strategies. This was a case where a partner had come to us, they had a hypothesis around a uh, KRAS to find uh, non-small cell lung cancer adenocarcinoma. It was based off the biology of their, of their, of their drug. We went to our collection, we built 12 PDX models, 12 patient drive xenograph models. So now this is capturing kind of a mini, you know, a mini trial, a mini population-based trial, where there's 12 of them, 12 patients. These patients happen to be mouse patients harboring human tumors, right? Um, and so we established those we established those models, and clinically there's divert there um, the back there. Sort of uh, at the patient level. There's clinical diversity in terms of their histories, their gender, their age, right? It matches the kind of diversity you're going to see in a clinical trial, is what I'm trying to say. Um, histologically, you can look at uh, this, is, this is half of those models. Um, they are adenocarcinomas, but they have mean histologies across the population. And then genomically, they also have unique uh, mutational profiles. They're all KRAS G12 mutants. But the mutational context that surrounds that KRAS, uh, uh, that KRAS uh, unified mutation, is certainly different. The mutation in FGFR or or RET or RAF, for example. And so now we have sort of a max diversity collection, and this is by design, was to try and create as much diversity as we can to mirror the diversity that's observed in a clinical trial, right? Um, it's not all comers. It's pretty well defined. Not small cell lung cancer, adenocarcinoma, KRS mutant, right? We run the trial. So what you're looking at here are pharmacology results uh, from the tumor, from the tumor bearing eyes, patient bearing xenograft models. And what you can see is on this right hand side, nine out of twelve had very strong responses, right? And then three out of twelve didn't. And so those, so this kind of data was actually enough um, to help the clinical team now design strategy around the phase two approach. Right? This phase two approach became um, mutationally defined, biomarker defined, and ultimately is now in, in clinical testing now. These populations here became really interesting as well because they became the basis of trying to understand exclusion criteria, not for that phase two trial, but for trials that came later. And the more targeted, the more defined we can create our clinical population, the more uh, more effective potentially these therapies can, can the more therapeutic benefit they can they can uh, offer when they get to their intended population. So um, we'll dive too too much into it. We do a lot of just kind of standard sort of run of the mill assays. Um, these are a little over 100 cell line xenograft models. We do a lot of ortho, orthotopic and metastatic modeling um, as well. And these are sort of all the luciferase uh, uh, lines that we have established within our biogrow facility to support those kinds of studies. But in my uh, uh, sort of next maybe 10 minutes or so, I want to take you through what uh, what we can do for immuno-oncology. Because everything we've talked about thus far, the in vitro models, the in vivo models, have all been absent of one thing, which is an immune cell, right? And clearly, um, the, the benefits that we've seen from, drug, from drugs like Keytruda and others, looking at PD-1, checkpoint inhibition, now looking at dendritic cells, or looking at, at, at other uh, macrophage um, targets. Right? This is really important to be able to model out. So, um, but the, the basis of it, which is preclinical, which is basically being able to look at a patient population, um, remains the same. We evaluate our, our drugs, live or die, they, they, they succeed or fail, in a population study. So our feeling is, preclinically, we should be looking at those same kinds of population studies. So this is the same pinwheel, our very large biobank, which a, a lot of ideas emanate from. Um, and what we're able to do when we have someone who, a uh, partner has got a novel target, let's say a novel checkpoint target that they're trying to uh, track down, they're trying to look at and understand what population 
what does my patient population potentially look like? That's what I was trying to say there. Um, so we can select from tens of thousands of patients. This, um, and one point I haven't made, actually, is that these specimens are absolutely unique in the fact that they're frozen down as cell suspensions. Right? And that means that they're flow cytometry ready. It's a big deal when trying to screen for protein targets uh, across hundreds or, or, or more patients, especially in the early days of a drug pro of a target where you probably don't have an IHC assay established. So the only way to look at these kinds of targets is either by Western blot or some other, you know, or, or flow cytometry, but some other more early stage uh, protein detection, target detection assay. So I'll give you one example of uh, how quickly we're able to do this kind of thing. So we were working with a partner who was very interested in understanding, this was a few years ago, so it was PD-1, um, but looking at PD-1 specifically on a subset of, of uh, CD4 T cells. And they, they, were, they want to know, does the melanoma patient profile uh, have this population, right? What is the prevalence of CD4 PD-1 positive melanoma um, or, or uh, tumor cells within a melanoma population. So we went to our collection, small study again, 10 melanoma samples, um, and ultimately did that screen. And so I'll take you, we screened all 10, all 10 patients. I'll take you to the kind of the, the very end here. Um, and what you're seeing is on the bottom, uh, which is patient eight actually, um, a strong PD-1 positive CD4, that's CD4, that's CD8, CD4 positive population. So um, you don't have the results here, you just have a few isolated data sets. But essentially what we're able to understand is uh, within a, melan a defined melanoma population of patients, X percent have high PD-1 CD4 positivity. Right? That was an important point. Um, and that information helps to guide, okay, do we go to melanoma, do we go to lung cancer? So you can imagine other studies being done here, right? Um, and could we potentially use that as an actual uh, inclusion criteria marker? Now, this is flow cytometry, which is you know common. I mean, most labs can do it. Um, but what can't be done again is really, is, or what is unique here is the speed at which this was done. Right? We went to the bank, and it's not magic exactly, but we do have a bank of very large bank of tumors. Went to the bank, pulled the tumors out, thawed them, stained them, flow cytometry. You know, essentially a week later, you've got your data set done. So something that might have taken months and months, uh, now it takes weeks. Fine. Right. I'm going to skip through this. Um, some additional assays that uh, I'll, I'll just kind of run through a, a little bit. I'll go back one sec. Which are lymphocyte activation and, and cancer cell co culture. We do quite a bit of that as well. Uh, some of this is run of the mill, so I, I, uh, it's important sort of um, important. Um, Workhorse kind of kind of kind of, kind of uh, uh, testing, um, like uh, looking at uh, T cell activation assays, uh, mix mix culture assays, cytotoxicity, ADCC with NK cells, PBMCs, lymphocytes. You know, all that is all that is something that we do. It's routine and something that we're happy to do. But some of the exciting things I want to come back to are actually have to do with utilizing that in vitro 3D culture system within an immune competent setting. Right, so I share with you sort of the, the basics of that 3D culture system in a, uh, in a setting where we didn't have any immune cells present. Um, and here's one where, where we do. And so this is essentially taking a, this happens to be a cell line actually, a luciferase tag Bragi line, which is the Burkitt's lymphoma, and uh, mixing it with a defined CAR T. And so what you're looking at here actually, we can just look right here, you're looking at different uh, different ratios of uh, tumor cell uh, with CAR T titration, and you can see as the CAR T increases, the luminescence of the cancer cell goes down. The cancer cell is being there's a, there's there's uh, uh, anti cancer effect over time. That certainly increases. So this this platform really allows us to now look at within a, that 3D human tumor microenvironment aligned condition with immune cells. And I'll admit the CAR-T is probably, in terms of a modeling system, the lowest hanging fruit. Um, and uh, be able to look at these, these immune-mediated effects. When we go ahead and, same data, trans, trans, try and translate this into the next step, which is an in vivo model, which 
is an in vivo model, um, we really see very similar results. And uh, just very quickly, what you're looking at here in that first row is, uh, is a mouse that's had this, uh, this superase tagline uh, injected you know, and grafted into it. You can see on day 34, there's a huge outgrowth of the tumor. Um, the second row is actually a non-engineered uh, T cell, so this is a natural T cell that, has, that has not had the CAR T engineering performed. Um, tumor grows well. The next two rows basically show the CAR T more functioning quite, quite well. And this really recapitulated the kind of data that we observed in our uh, 3D ex vivo platform. So it was very confirmatory and uh, validating in that way. A lot of work we're doing right now, I don't have the data in here, but a lot of work we're doing right now to actually look at um, till expansion and utilizing those tills uh, in an autologous fashion with the same tumor, um, all coming out of the direct patient tissue itself. Uh, finally, um, I'm just going to kind of uh, not go through all the details here, but we do, again, a lot of workhorse, uh, a lot of workhorse studies <coughs> in vivo side of things using skin genetic models. We've got uh, a dozen syngenetic lines uh, in, in house. Really, eight of those or so are validated, are validated really well. Happy to share that kind of standard of care data. In fact, the database that client, the, the data portal that I mentioned, is something that will host all this data. We'll be able to query. Um, this is uh, being able to pharmacology, being able to do new phenotyping. Um, these are all, all certainly capabilities within the BioDuro uh, world. And finally, I'll just leave you at this. Um, really, being able to utilize a large collection of patient tumors allows us to look at and run the kinds of population studies that we run in the clinic. And ultimately, um, whether it's immunophenotyping, whether it's in vitro 3D tumor microenvironment studies, in vivo patient-derived xenograft studies, I think it ultimately comes to this, which is building confidence, right? We're here in a pre when we're doing work with with, uh, with, with molecules or um, antibodies or um, whatever test article you might imagine. Actually, in a preclinical setting, our job is not to show efficacy, and, and uh, we don't feel this. Our job is not to show efficacy and necessarily move it on to the next uh, to the next uh, hurdle, right, or through the next hurdle. But it's really to help set the clinical strategy. And that clinical strategy certainly can come from identifying patient populations on the biomarker side, for example, looking at what are the most comprehensive, what are the best combination uh, partners to be utilized, or even looking at, uh, you mentioned biomarkers, but looking at biomarkers or cellular markers um, as a way to think about even a companion diagnostic or um, patient inclusion criteria generally. Too. So hopefully, we're able to take all this forward, which is tying it back to that initial piece, which is. Oncology suffers, development suffers from low probability of success, inching that forward, improving that cost-benefit analysis, getting better treatments, more effective treatments to patients, and um, really through use, I think, of having access to all this tissue, doing it very quickly um, with that resource available. Thank you guys all very much. <laughs>